Who's that girl? Where is she from? How long has she been in Moscow? Does she speak Russian? So, <clears throat> how many of you have these questions? Please raise your hand. How many of you get these questions? How many of you get these questions every day? Great, thank you. I get these questions every day, no matter where I am, on the street, on the metro, my favorite place, or in the shopping center. So the odd thing is, is that depending on my mood, depending on how my week has gone, and depending on how I feel, I answer these questions differently. And I've learned that most people only listen to these questions for about 30 to 40, only listen to the answers for about 30 to 45 seconds, which is not a lot of time. Oh, the pressure. How long, what do you like about Moscow? Where's your favorite place? And I just feel the pressure of 30 seconds. Go, answer the question quickly. And how can I give the answer to a true perspective of how I feel and where I, have, where I have been in the right amount of time. Lucky for you, I get a few minutes to answer these questions. So I'll take you back to the time I was asked to give this speech or talk. And I didn't know what I was to talk about. There were so many great speakers about uh, cryptocurrency or sign language or about love, like our last speaker. And I had no idea what I was to talk about. So I called my grandmother. Grandmother said, Asia, it's easy. Talk about the simple things. Talk about your experience. Talk about where you have been. And for you, it may be simple, but for other people, maybe not. So let's go way back in the day. And I was a little girl. And if I may be personal, my parents are divorced. And they got divorced a long time ago. And they went to court all the time. My dad fought for us. My mother fought for us, custody. And they went to the judge, and the smartest judge in the world said that I should be raised in California with my mom, and my brother should be raised in Florida with my dad. Smart, right? But the bright side is that I got to fly from California to Florida every summer once a month with my brother, my dad, my family, my aunts, my uncles, they showered us with gifts. You know about Universal Studios, you know about Disney World and Mickey Mouse. Uh, we had all of that. And my brother got to fly from Florida to California with Disneyland, which is not as great as Disney World, but it was nice, with me, my mom, my aunts, my uncles, all of my family. I remember the smell getting off of the plane, and how different it felt from California to Florida, only four hours away. Fast forwarding to university. I got accepted to Florida A&M University, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. This is an historically black college or university. There are about 101 historically black colleges and university in America. And I was accepted into one of them. These were made, as you probably all know, were made before the civil rights movement in America. Before African Americans could vote, before African Americans could work, before African Americans could study. And I was accepted to one of them. All of the students at FAMU looked like me. All, 
Approximately 80% of the professors with PhDs and vast backgrounds looked like me, and they gave me the opportunity to understand my culture, which we didn't learn in, in middle school and uh, lower elementary school in America. They don't teach us, us these things. And so at FAMU, they taught us this. It was wonderful. I studied psychology. I worked in a psychiatric clinic. And if you can think about this psychiatry, as one of our speakers talked about, and how it could um, kind of change our minds, I worked there. And if you know about the full moon, and how when the full moon comes out, the wolves howl. Arr! And if you know about this, this is what happened at the psychiatric clinic. I worked there overnight, 12 hours, for three nights a week. And then I was off, and then I was back on. So anything that you can imagine, it happened there. So I took interviews of the clients that came in. And I think I took part of them with me. Therefore, I decided to go to India. And India was an amazing amazing experience. Again, I remember the smell as I broke into the Indian atmosphere and landed. I could remember the smell and how different it was from California, the salty kind of smell, or Florida, the muggy, sticky smell. In India, have you all been to India? It was different, <laughs> to say the least. So, I got off the plane, taxi, 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 no rules, no boundaries, no nothing. I worked with the uh, people who had leprosy there. I took interviews of them. I was there for about a summer, and it was magnificent. I went back to Florida, and I continued to work in a psychiatric clinic. Then I decided I should volunteer. And the agency that I volunteered for sent me to Kyrgyzstan. Have you all been to Kyrgyzstan? Are you from Kyrgyzstan? <laughs> woo woo! Okay, so I went to Kyrgyzstan. Amazing. I was there for two years. I worked in the village. I worked with the teachers and the mothers and some of the fathers and the children in Kyrgyzstan. And it was amazing. I felt like I was Kyrgyz, I mean, after two years living in the village. And sometimes I was upset because I would walk through the bazaar and as my Kyrgyz was getting better, you know, I could hear people talking about me in Kyrgyz. And they would say, oh, look at the black girl. Oh, is that her real hair? Oh, where is she from? And I would angrily say to them, hey, I'm a person. Talk to me as a person. Ask me my name. And I would expect them to respond like, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, please forgive. But no. They said, ah, oh, you speak Kyrgyz. Ah, oh, hey, she speaks Kyrgyz. Look at her. So everybody, then they would tell the next person and the next person. And so I'm walking down the bazaar trying to buy my uh, fruit and trying to buy my pomidori. And they would just uh, be so excited that I speak Kyrgyz. And uh, it would defeat the purpose. So I wrote a poem uh, about my experiences in Kyrgyzstan. And can I read it to you? Because I love poetry. And this is how I record my thoughts. Is it okay if I read my poem? <clears throat> Aisha, eat, drink. When I sit down, when I sit down at the table, that's all I hear when I want to take a break. I dare not put my fork down or the community will activate. Eat from the meat. Drink from the tea. You must be fat and healthy like me. Oh, your two words of Kyrgyz is superb. And you're beautiful too. We will bright kidnap you. K 
Can you milk a cow? No. Can you clean our house? No. Can you cook our national food, besh barmak? I don't think so. Don't worry. We will teach you. You'll be my slave, uh, <laughs> my assistant, and my son's wife, too. We'll wrap a white scarf around you, and you'll cry until your wedding night. Not to fear, my dear. We'll be here to comfort you. Remember, every good marriage begins in tears. We've all suffered and survived, our grandmothers too. This will continue throughout the years. Then I get serious. Time to change the subject. <clears throat> uh, the food is so wonderful, I say. Oh, we were just kidding, they play. Yeah, just to reiterate, I'll be leaving in May. Thank you for your company. Thank you for your time. Your country is so beautiful, and I will keep you all in mind. Thank you. So I've had a lot of experiences sitting at the table with Kyrgyz people at a funeral or at a wedding, and it was wonderful. And I learned to eat really slowly and also to enjoy the company around me. After Kyrgyzstan, um, oh, besides hiking and seeing Isagata and Isakol and many other places, seeing my first waterfall, I had two choices, to go to Sierra, Sierra Leone or to come here in Moscow. So I wanted to practice my Russian and be fluent in Russian. And so I decided to come here in Moscow. And as I came here, I understood that many people just want to know about me, and I'm a rarity. These questions are not just from when I'm traveling internationally, but also from my family. My parents, my aunts, my uncles always ask me, when are you coming back to America? You are American. Why don't you study in America? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Why don't you come back? So my dad, he gifted me socks, warm socks, you know, for the winter. And the colors are red, white, and blue. My dad said, here, Asia, you are American. Don't forget it. Red, white, and blue, America. I said, well, dad, I'm a little confused because the Russian flag is also red, white, and blue. So what am I? And he said, oh, my goodness, how am I supposed to know this? And so now, just like in Kyrgyzstan, I feel like I'm Russian. But you all don't see that, although I feel like that. And I realized that people just want to find some type of similarity. And that's what we all should be doing, is finding some type of similarity within each other asking each other questions and finding out where each other have come from and where each other are going. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just enjoying the journey. So if I have to leave you with something, as my grandmother told me, that if you go through big storms, the small ones don't matter. And the bigger the struggle, as in language for me and in, here in Russia, or waking up and hearing a different language outside of the street, it's the challenge that keeps me here. So it's a big struggle. This is not a big struggle, but the big struggle that will keep me going. So I encourage you all to try to find similarities in each other and enjoy the big struggle, enjoy the process, enjoy the journey. Thank you.